Welcome back to Faxverse. It's no secret that you all love Gilligan's Island, and especially Marianne. Today, we have a special video to share. Much like our Brady Bunch compilation video last month, we've made a compilation of our favorite facts and stories from Gilligan's Island. Are you the biggest fan? Well, prove it with our Gilligan's Island quiz at the end. Finally, before you hop in the comments and proclaim whether you're Team Mary Ann or Team Ginger, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Fact or re record. Jerry Van Dyke could have been Gilligan. Jerry Van Dyke was offered the role of Gilligan, but he turned it down. The reason was he didn't want to be part of an ensemble cast. Jerry wanted to be successful like his older brother Dick and wanted to have his own TV show. A year later, he got his chance in the show My Mother the Car. The show didn't last, and he regretted his decision. Fans are happy because it's hard to imagine anyone other than Bob Denver playing Gilligan. Other characters were considered. Jerry Van Dyke wasn't the only one who turned down a role on Gilligan's Island. Carol O'Connor, a.k.a. Archie Bunker, turned down the part of the skipper. Raquel Welch and Jane Mansfield turned down the role of Ginger. Fortunately, the directors got the cast just right because these people were terrific together. Six women played Ginger. Tina Louise played Ginger, but she didn't really like it. In the spin-offs and sequels, Tina didn't sign on, and other actresses stepped in. In the pilot, Kit Smythe played Ginger, and she was a secretary. When they decided to make Ginger a movie star, Tina Louise got the part. In The Rescue from Gilligan's Island and The Castaways on Gilligan's Island, Judith Baldwin played Ginger. Constance Forslund played Ginger on the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. Jane Webb voiced Ginger in the animated series, The New Adventures of Gilligan. In the 1982 cartoon Gilligan's Planet, Don Wells voiced both Ginger and Marianne. The Flag and the Opening Credits The pilot was first filmed in November 1963. On the last day of production in Hawaii, the cast found out that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In the opening credits, there's an American flag flying at half-mast in honor of JFK. The Skipper The Skipper's real name was Jonas Grumby. It was mentioned in the pilot, but not much after. His backstory has him serving on a PT with JFK and Quentin McHale of McHale's Navy. Gilligan's Name Gilligan's first name wasn't Gilligan. It was his last name. His full name is Willie Gilligan. The SS Minnow Charles Maxwell was the voice on the radio. The castaways were always tuning in to their portable radio to see what was going on in the world. The voice on the radio was Charles Maxwell, and it was uncredited. He also appeared in Gunsmoke, Bonanza, Rawhide, and The Rifleman. Even though his role on Gilligan's Island was uncredited, it was his longest recurring role. It was originally a six-hour tour. The pilot theme song mentioned the castaways being on a six-hour tour. When the song was rewritten, it was changed to a three-hour tour. They climb aboard and they step inside With just enough bags for a six-hour ride The Ballad of Davy Crockett The original The Childless Howells had a child in a later show. On the show, the Howells had no children. In the reunion movie, The Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island, their son, Thurston Howell IV, was introduced. The decision to give the couple a son was due to the poor health of Jim Backus. He tried to do the movie, but due to his weakened state, he could only appear briefly. This was when the writers decided to bring in the couple's son to round out the cast a bit. Martin Landau and Barbara Bain Martin and Barbara were a married couple who starred together in Mission Impossible and Space 1999. Their last appearance was in the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island in 1981. They stopped working together for good and divorced in 1993. Dusty's Trail After Gilligan's Island, Sherwood Schwartz hit the jackpot again with the Brady Bunch. Unfortunately, the third time was not a charm. In 1974, he created Gilligan's Island in a Wild West setting. Bob Denver starred in the show alongside Forrest Tucker from F Troop. The show had a wealthy couple, a brainiac, a farm girl, and a bombshell. Sound familiar? Unfortunately, the show wasn't as successful as Gilligan's Island, and the show was canceled after one season. Tina Louise and Bob Denver worked together before Gilligan's Island. Months before Gilligan's Island, Bob Denver and Tina Louise starred in the summer surf film For Those Who Think Young. It was a teen comedy that also starred Nancy Sinatra and Ellen Burstyn. Bob says that when filming began on Gilligan's Island, that it was nice to see a familiar face, especially since he and Tina had just finished working together on the surf movie. The island's location. The cast was on Roseanne. In a tribute to Sherwood Schwartz, a few of the cast members appeared on Roseanne, and they each played a different character. Tina Louise played Roseanne, Don Wells played Darlene, and Bob Denver played Jackie. It was a hilarious way for the cast to reunite. Alan Hale Jr. played a chef on Batman. 
In the Batman episode titled The Og and I, Alan Hale, aka The Skipper, plays a chef named Gilligan. When the chief enters a diner, Alan's character serves him a hot pastrami and a large milk. Denver, Colorado Colorado's capital city, Denver, was named after James William Denver. James William Denver also happens to be the great-great-grandfather of Bob Denver, aka Gilligan. Here's another fun fact. Bob Denver and John Denver are not related. John Denver's real name is Henry John Deutschendorf Jr. A cartoon spinoff in outer space. As we mentioned earlier, there have been plenty of Gilligan's Island spinoffs, and some were animated. In Gilligan's Planet, the castaways went to outer space. It only lasted 13 episodes. This was the final Saturday morning cartoon ever produced by Filmation. When Gilligan's Planet ended, the company shifted to producing syndicated content. Which one of these facts was your favorite? Let us know in the comments. Marianne and Ginger were the two most popular female characters from the 1960s sitcom Gilligan's Island. Still, there is a decades-long debate between the characters Marianne and Ginger. Both of these characters are charming in their own ways, but there's no denying how wildly different they are from each other. In today's video, we're going to end the decades-long debate between Ginger and Marianne once and for all. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, of course, but we strongly believe that Marianne is simply the better choice. And if you agree, be sure to check out our custom Marianne shirts below this video. And make sure you stick around until the end of the video, where we'll show you just how much support the actor from Marianne received from her fans after she was struck by tragedy. Facts First presents Why We Love Marianne More Than Ginger, Gilligan's Island. Marianne and Ginger were completely different. Many popular sitcoms capitalize on the chemistry of an ensemble cast. Gilligan's Island was ingenious because it took that idea to the extreme. This is why there's so much debate between the two. The arguments tend to become polarized as different fans take extreme opinions on who they prefer, Marianne or Ginger. If you still haven't decided who you prefer yet, don't worry. We're going to do our best to show you why Marianne deserves all the love. Marianne is more practical. Sure, Ginger's a fun character. After all, who wouldn't want to become friends with a Hollywood star? However, the circumstances in which you would want to meet that star are very important. A high-maintenance diva is the last person you would want to be marooned on an island with. Marianne, with her sensible farm girl ways, proves time and time again she's more practical and resourceful than her counterpart. While Ginger spends much of her time complaining about the conditions she has to live in, Marianne proves herself as an invaluable team member with her wit. Also, she doesn't have any qualms about getting dirty. When it comes to usefulness to the team of marooned characters, Marianne is the obvious choice. If you'd rather be marooned on an island with Marianne than Ginger, click the like button to let us know. Better yet, buy one of our Marianne t-shirts so that everyone knows where you stand with regards to this debate. Marianne is more realistic. One of the elements the show touches on subtly is that Ginger is unattainable. All the single men in the show lust after Ginger, but in a distant manner. Even though they live on the same island as her throughout the show, they know that Ginger is nothing more than a fantasy. She's beautiful and glamorous, but is she relationship material? Probably not. Marianne, meanwhile, is innocent and pure, as well as surprisingly tough. She's humble, sweet, and beautiful in her- Even though the show was a sitcom, Gilligan's Island wasn't afraid to touch on some subtle and serious themes. Many times, the girl next door is overlooked in favor of a glamorous but unattainable diva. When it comes to romance, Marianne wins yet again. Everybody loved Don Wells. Marianne was played by a beautiful and talented actress, Don Wells. In 1959, she won a beauty pageant competition and was crowned Miss Nevada. Even though Marianne might look a bit plain in comparison to the glitz and glamour of Ginger, there's no denying how gorgeous she is. Many viewers at the time agreed. Poor Don Wells was swamped with fan letters, mostly from men. Some asked her out on dates, while others even went as far as to propose to her. Furthermore, she was ranked on TV Guide's list of 50 sexiest stars of all time in 2005. Marianne's simple yet signature outfit consisted of short shorts and a red gingham blouse. The look was so iconic that during a Beverly Hills off, aside from her beauty, Don Wells was also an accomplished actress, both before and after her time on Gilligan's Island. Before landing the role of Marianne, she acted in the film The New Interns and appeared on a variety of TV shows, including Bonanza and 77 Sunset Strip. After Gilligan's Island, Don Wells continued her passion for acting and appeared in films such as Super Sucker and Cyber Meltdown. Don Wells worked hard to land the role. True to the hard-working fashion of Marianne, Don Wells had to put in a lot of effort to win the role. 
Auditioning for a TV show is an arduous and nerve-wracking process, but Don Wells kept her cool even though she was competing against some amazingly talented actors. Both Raquel Welsh and Pat Priest auditioned for the role of Marianne, but it was Wells who succeeded in playing her. Marianne is a consistent favorite. If you don't believe our reasons for preferring Marianne to fans almost always choose Marianne over Ginger, but why? Something about Marianne's sweet and innocent farm girl charm seems to best Ginger's high-maintenance personality every single time. Even decades after the show ended, Marianne seems to remain in the fans' hearts. Part of Marianne's appeal while Marianne was helpful and friendly. No wonder Marianne is a favorite. Don Wells received tons of support from her fans. Many people think that television and movie stars are safe from financial burden. However, the truth is Don Wells' time as a television star is long gone. Even though she guest starred in several shows and appeared in a few films, she's not as young as she used to be. And actors have to pay bills and taxes just like the rest of us. Poor Don Wells was greatly impacted by the stock market crash of 2008, and she found herself in financial trouble. Despite her struggles, she continued to work for nonprofit organizations to help those less fortunate than herself. However, tragedy struck when Don Wells was injured in a horrible accident. She had to undergo a dangerous surgery that could have cost her her life. After the surgery, she was forced to recuperate for two long months. Between the surgery and the stock market crash, Don Wells found herself in dire trouble. Fortunately, her close friend Doug Kirkpatrick knew just how much she was struggling, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. He created a GoFundMe page for his dear friend to raise $180,000. He hoped people would be willing to pitch in so that Don Wells wouldn't be as overwhelmed with her medical bills and taxes. Wells was astonished to find the support that poured out from the community in her favor. Before long, they had raised $52,000, which helped Don out immensely. After many long years working for nonprofit organizations as a humanitarian, Don Wells realized that the world was just as willing to help her out when she found herself in a bind. On Twitter, she thanked the many people who donated to her GoFundMe, ending the tweet with, I am grateful to any of my fans who are willing to offer support. However, please know that my outlook is positive, and I look forward to seeing you all in my travels. Truly, her fan support is a mark of how popular she was and continues to be. As you can see, there are countless reasons why Mary Ann is consistently viewed as a more popular character than Ginger. Do you prefer Mary Ann or Ginger? If you prefer Mary Ann, don't forget to check out our Mary Ann t-shirts below. And if you prefer Ginger, defend your choice in the comments. Though the show's creator had anticipated that Ginger Grant, given her glam goddess avatar and Marilyn Monroe vibes, would eventually become every man's dream, to their surprise, it was Marianne who quickly became everyone's favorite. As it turns out, Don Wells recently addressed her iconic role and what it was like to be lusted after by so many viewers. Facts Verse presents, Don Wells addresses Marianne's sex appeal. Before we settle one of the biggest debates launched by American television, we ask you to take a moment and like and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you never miss a video. On September 26, 1964, the first episode of Gilligan's Island aired on CBS. The show revolved around the lives of seven castaways lost on a deserted island. Bob Denver played the titular role of Gilligan, the clumsy and accident-prone first mate of SS Minnow, the boat that wrecked at a deserted island in the Pacific. Alan Hale Jr. played the warm-hearted but irritable skipper. Jim Backus played the role of incredibly rich Mr. Thurston Howell III, and Natalie Schaefer played his wife, Lovely Howell. The cast had two other faces, who launched one of the most prominent debates in television history, Ginger or Marianne. Ginger, played by Tina Louise, was a Hollywood star reminiscent of Marilyn Monroe. She was attractive, glamorous, and most men wouldn't mind paying their life savings to be stuck with her on a deserted island. While Ginger would often use her sexuality to get the castaways out of trouble, she didn't have any of the life skills people need to survive on a deserted island. On the other hand, Marianne, played by Don Wells, who was also Miss Nevada, was the quintessential girl next door. She was chirpy, cute, lovable, sensitive, and caring. The writers based her character on Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, and she was certainly the most down-to-earth woman on the island. The last episode of the show aired in 1967, and the show continued in syndication for many years. Gilligan's Island went off the year 53 years ago, and yet both Marianne and Ginger live on. However, over the years, more men have labeled themselves as Marianne guys over Ginger Grant guys. So what is it about the character of Marianne that makes her so lovable? 
In an interview, Don Wells shared her opinion on the subject. According to Don, what made Marianne so appealing was that she was the epitome of goodness. She was always cooking, cleaning, and helping people around, and she did all that without making any complaints. More importantly, though she was aware of other people's flaws, she never reacted to them in a bad way. For instance, she knew all about the goof-ups that Gilligan did, but she never lost her temper with him. She wasn't jealous of Ginger and the attention she got. All in all, it was Marianne's innate good-heartedness that made her so popular. Don Wells also thinks one of the reasons why men still find Marianne sexy is because, unlike Ginger, she is attainable. While Ginger was the ultimate beauty queen, her star vibe rendered her unattainable. Moreover, Ginger came across as someone very high-maintenance. If you took her out on a date, nothing less than champagne would do. Marianne, on the other hand, was the woman who looked like she could do both, look pretty, and run a house. She was also the kind of woman men could take home to their mothers. While discussing Marianne's sexual appeal, Don also talked about how the rules regarding the depiction of women on the screen have changed over the years, and the role she played in accentuating Marianne's sex appeal. Back in the 1960s, CBS had a three-second rule, which forbade creators and directors to reveal cleavage or navel for more than three seconds. Thus, when the time came to decide on Marianne's costumes, Don helped the designers design shorts that would cover her navel but make her legs look longer. Pictures of Marianne in these shorts still abound on the internet, and many believe it was these short shorts that gave Marianne the sex appeal that made her desirable to so many young men. The last episode of the show aired in 1967, and though Gilligan's Island enjoyed top ratings, it never entered the annals of television history as an iconic or timeless show. However, the character of Marianne lives on. Don Wells often talks about how popular the show made her. In an interview, she shared a story when she and five of her friends went on a trip to the Solomon Islands, a relatively deserted place. They had gone there expecting no electricity, television, or running water. However, what Don experienced really surprised her. As soon as they hit the island, the chief's wife instantly recognized Don Wells. She had gone to a nursing school on Haniara in the 1970s, and while there, she had often seen reruns of Gilligan's Island. Dawn said she gets recognized almost everywhere she goes, and she credits all her success and fame to the memorable character of Marianne. However, Dawn wasn't the only choice for the role. It's believed that Raquel Welsh also auditioned for the role of Marianne. Dawn, however, is unaware of this. Though she's of the opinion that if Raquel Welsh indeed auditioned for Gilligan's Island, she would have been a better fit for the role of Ginger than Marianne. After all, Raquel was a beautiful sex symbol in real life, and so was Ginger on the show. Though Tina Louise, who played Ginger, and Don Wells were cordial on the set, they've not stayed in touch over the years, even though the two are the only living members of the cast. Don says after the show ended, Louise decided to do her own thing and... Though they are not in touch, and even after all the pitting against each other they've undergone since the beginning of the show, Don does have some fond memories of working with Louise. She remembers the time when Louise had recently gotten married and, like her on-screen character, knew nothing about cooking. So she asked Wells to help her with the Thanksgiving dinner. Don invited Louise to her house, and she remembers Louise sitting on a cooking stool with her mom, reading and discussing recipes and writing everything down. Years later, when Wells ran into Caprice, Louise's daughter, she was surprised to know that Louise had told her daughter all about their Thanksgiving dinner. When we look back, it's hard to believe that it's been over 50 years since the last episode of Gilligan's Island aired on CBS. In the show, Tina Louise played the role of the glamorous Ginger Grant, a movie star and a breathy sex symbol, and Don Wells played Marianne, the beautiful, chirpy, caring girl next door. Given the way Grant's character was written, the writers took it for granted she would eventually become TV's ultimate sex icon, to a glamour goddess. Gilligan's Island may not be as popular as some of the other shows of its time. However, it's certainly become a part of American culture owing to its memorable characters. Don Wells, at least, credits the show for most of her success. After the show ended, Wells continued with her acting career, but she will always be remembered as the lovable Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island. The show's last episode aired on April 17, 1967, which was a massive disappointment to the public. If you think you know everything about Gilligan's Island, think again. We got a few things that you probably didn't know about the show that was so popular in the 60s. Before we get into our video, jump down to the comments and let us know what is your favorite episode of Gilligan's Island. Or, if you're a guy, which is it? Ginger or Marianne? Uh, I'm a Marianne guy. All the way.
Natalie Schaefer was the actress who played Mrs. Lovey Howell. She accepted the role because she would get a free trip to Hawaii to film the pilot. This was a bit strange because she was already a millionaire and could have afforded the trip on her own. Natalie had no children, so she left her fortune to her poodle. When the dog died, the money was donated to the Motion Picture and Television Fund. She also left some of her wealth to Dawn Wells, the actress who played Marianne. Dawn took care of Natalie while she was fighting breast cancer. Before the show premiered, the producers decided to replace the character that ranked low with the audience. These included John Gabriel, who played the professor, Kit Smythe, who played a high school science teacher named Ginger, and Nancy McCarthy, who played Bunny, a secretary. When they replaced the actress who played Ginger, they decided to make her a movie star instead. They decided to make Bunny the kind-hearted Marianne. Raquel Welch was almost chosen for the role of Marianne, but they decided that she didn't have the girl-next-door quality to play the part. That ended up going to Don Wells, who was perfect for the role. The show's inspiration came from a New York university professor who taught public speaking. He asked the class to write a one-minute speech answering the questions, if you were stranded on a desert island, what item would you want to have the most? Well, the show's creator, Sherwood Schwartz, was in the class, and that question stuck with him for years. It got his college class speaking about it, so he decided to pitch a show about a group of people with completely different personalities being stranded together on an island. And then Gilligan's Island was born. Speaking of the main character, Gilligan, his first name was actually never mentioned on the show. Gilligan is his last name. Bob Denver, the actor who played Gilligan, insisted that Gilligan was the character's first name. Sherwood Schwartz says no, his real name is Willie Gilligan, even though it was never mentioned on the show. Sherwood and Bob argued about this quite often, and Bob refused to believe that Willie was his character's first name. Natalie Schaefer was in her 60s when the show filmed. She was one of the only female cast members to do her own stunts. She jumped in the lagoon or jumped into the fake quicksand often. In 1965, she interviewed with Let's Be Beautiful columnist Arlene Dahl and said that swimming and a special ice cream diet kept her in good shape. While on a diet, she ate only a quart of ice cream a day. She also swam naked in her backyard pool. While on her diet and exercise plan, Natalie lost three pounds in five days. I might have to go out and buy myself some Rocky Road. Jim Backus was the actor who played Thurston Howell III. In Don Wells' book, What Would Mary Ann Do? Guide to Life, she wrote about a lunch with Jim Backus. Jim had invited Don and Natalie to lunch and and when the check arrived, he realized that he forgot his wallet. Before the cast left for the summer break, they had a wrap party. During the party, Natalie gave Jim a bill for $300. That was the amount he owed for the meals that he didn't pay for. Jim finally paid what he owed. The opening credits of the first season end with the lyrics, The Movie Star, and a photo of Ginger that had the words, and also starring Tina Louise as Ginger, at the bottom of the screen. The theme song ended with, and the rest, but didn't include any other names. This was because Tina's contract stated that nobody else would follow her name in the credits. This meant that Don Wells and Russell Johnson weren't in the opening credits. During season two, Bob Danver told the producers that they needed to be added in the opening credits since their characters were equally as important as the others. Bob Danver once did an interview with TV Guide for the January 23, 1965 edition. During the interview, he said that the cast didn't get along well with Tina Louise. He didn't say why the other cast members didn't get along with her, but only that she ignored them. Between scenes, while the cast was talking and joking around, Tina would be off by herself. Most believed that was because Tina was told by her agent that she would be the star of the show. When Bob was asked to pose for pictures with Tina, he refused. During the first season of the show, the Coast Guard got some pretty strange telegrams from fans. These people believe the cast really was stranded on a desert island. Sherwood Schwartz also got some bizarre letters. He received one that read, "...for several weeks now we have seen American citizens stranded on some Pacific island. We spend millions in foreign aid. Why can't we send one U.S. destroyer to rescue those people before they starve to death. <laughs> I'm guessing it was just a joke. I mean, otherwise, how could these people not know that it was a show? Dawn Wells is said to have received around 5,000 fan letters every week. She says some of the letters got really creepy, too. One fan wrote that it was their anniversary because he'd been writing to her for 35 years. She says that some men let their imagination take over and they really believed that they had a relationship with Dawn. There was a time when Bob Denver almost lost his life while filming. In the scene, Gilligan was supposed to stack furniture in the Howell's hut to keep a lion out. In the middle of the scene, the lion jumped at Bob. His reaction was to karate chop the lion. When the lion jumped off the twin beds that it was standing on, they split. The trainer had to attack the lion in mid-air, and the trainer had claw marks all over him. Bob was so scared that his hair was standing on end. TV shows can't be perfect all the time, and there were some bloopers in the show, and if you look closely, you might see them because they ended up in the episodes. In the episode titled They're Off and Running, Bob Denver forgot to take his wedding ring off. 
and the friendly passenger. You can see buildings over the trees that day. Alan Hale Jr. was the actor who played the skipper, and during a scene he was supposed to fall from a coconut tree and land on a crash pad. He missed the pad and broke his arm, but didn't say anything. He didn't want his broken arm to disrupt filming. He had a lot to do with his arm, too, while it was broken, like hauling coconuts. It was weeks before he had his arm checked out and treated. This Gilligan's Island star gave the crew a little extra. It was actually a lot extra, because he never wanted to stop filming, and the crew didn't even know what was going on. Tina Louise has said numerous times that she did not like playing the character of Ginger, even though she was perfect for the role. When Tina decided to call it quits, Judith Baldwin took over. She played Ginger in the TV movie Rescue from Gilligan's Island and the follow-up to that, The Castaways on Gilligan's Island. In another TV movie, The Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island, Constance Forsland played Ginger. In the 1974 animated show The New Adventures of Gilligan, Jane Webb voiced Ginger. In the 1982 cartoon Gilligan's planet, Dawn Wells voiced both Mary Ann and Ginger. Natalie was not truthful about her age while filming the show. She was actually a decade older than her husband on the show, played by Jim Backus. Natalie looked really good for her age. One way she managed to cover up her age was listed in her contract. She didn't want any close-up shots to prevent people from seeing her wrinkles. Tina Louise says the show destroyed her career, even though she was a successful actress long after the show ended. Today, she lives in New York City and she's a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and Actors Studio. She also does a lot of work with child literacy. Part of the proceeds from her 2007 book, When I Grow Up, went to literacy programs. She's also been volunteering at local public schools since 1996. Fans have always believed that the Skipper's real name is just Skipper. Well, no, that's just the title. It's kind of like saying he's the captain. His real name was revealed only once during the show. It was in the very first episode that aired in 1964. During that episode, it was revealed that his real name was Jonas Grumby. Since then, it was never mentioned again. In the 2003 novel Gilligan's Wake, the skipper was given a dark backstory, and supposedly he served with Quentin McHale from TV's McHale's Navy. Jean Mansfield was a gorgeous and glamorous woman. When Gilligan's Island was recasting, her career was in decline. When it was decided that Ginger would be a movie star rather than a school secretary, the producers thought of Jane Mansfield. Jane's third husband told her not to take the role, and so she did. Instead, she took small parts in film and made appearances at nightclubs. A few years later, she died in a car accident on her way to do a television interview. She was just 34 years old. Had she took the role of Ginger, she might not have been on the road that day. If you watch the show, you know that underneath the skipper's rough exterior, there was a soft underneath. And I'm not talking about the belly. He often called Gilligan Little Buddy. But the writers didn't create that nickname. Sherwood would occasionally hear Alan Hale talking to the cast and crew offset, saying Little Facts First presents, The Professor Revealed the Gilligan's Island Location. Let's do a little bit of sleuthing. The whole debacle would be a lot simpler to decode if they had Google Maps and GPS back then. But, alas, the U.S. government wouldn't develop a global positioning system until 1973, and still yet it wouldn't be available for the general public's use for another decade. Gilligan, why couldn't you have waited a couple decades to take your ill-fated tour? Another piece of information that blurs the lines and makes this whole matter more complicated is that the show itself gives two completely different sets of latitude and longitude coordinates in its first season. There's no clues to help pinpoint the location. His lazy reply may have been the reason why they never got that rescue they needed so badly. Comparing and contrasting the coordinates. Okay, so we know one thing for certain. The crew sets out on their doomed voyage from Honolulu. And if we make the assumption that they set out going north and west, we find that 10 degrees north, 140 degrees west is much closer to Hawaii than the other set of numbers. So maybe, just maybe, we're onto something. Unfortunately, if we take a look at satellite imagery, we find a whole lot of nothing at that location, just a waft of blue. A very odd place to test a missile launch indeed. Things get a lot more exciting when we look at the other set of coordinates. Admittedly, they take us much further away from Hawaii than the first set and land us somewhere a lot closer to Mexico. But if you plug the 10 degrees north, 110 degrees west coordinates into Google Maps and look at the imagery, you'll find a tiny little speck of green very close to that location. Right there sits a tiny remote island very similar to the one that Gilligan and his friends might have washed up on. Kudos for the writing team for finding that tiny little island ages before the advent of 
GPS, Sandy Key Island. But maybe the coordinates are just as washed up as the minnow was. Let's take a peek at some clues from the show itself to see if we can figure out where the island was. Well, at least figure out where it was shot. That's got to count for something, right? So in the first season's opening theme, we get a shot of an island out in the distance. That island is known as Sandy Key. It's also colloquially known as the most photographed island in the world. Sandy Key is only three miles north of Paradise Island and just a hop, skip, and a jump from Nassau, home to giant resorts and vacation rentals. Not only is this key known for serving as the backdrop for Gilligan's Island, but its ideal beauty, white sandy beaches, crystal clear blue water, and coral reefs have brought the likes of countless fashion photographers and music video shoots, a key that we saw in season one. The new island is actually called Coconut Island, a very appropriate name considering the show's subject material and the island dweller's diet throughout the the seasons. Primarily, Coconut Island is used for research purposes as it's the home to the Institute of Marine Biology. It's the perfect location for aquatic research with its serene setting, biodiversity, and coral reefs. Coconut Island is also home to a marine air station that hosts Marine Corps fighter pilots. Two sides of the island are connected by a coastal highway with rural residential development, and the other side of the island is a beach facing the open sea. Other filming locations. The pilot and the first episode of season one were all filmed in Kauai, one of the most peaceful of the Hawaiian islands. Initially, the production crew scouted various locations in Los Angeles and Catalina Island. In case you were wondering, Catalina Island is just off the coast of Long Beach, California, about 30 miles from LA. Neither location really suited the needs of the show, however, and they decided that Kauai was their island. The next the next episode filmed combined footage from Kauai with on-location filming at Zuma Beach, which is adjacent to Malibu. Another fun piece of trivia is that when Bob Denver and the cast and crew arrived in Hawaii in 1963 to begin production, they stayed at a resort called Coco Palms, which is the same hotel that Elvis Presley stayed in during the filming of his island classic, Blue Hawaii, Hanalei Bay. The crew would move on from Coco Palms and make their way to Hanalei Bay in Princeville. The Hanalei Plantation is where the cast and crew would stay during the production of these early episodes. It consists of several small cottages and one larger building. The production designer behind the film South Pacific actually designed the plantation. While the crew was there, they would film at a place called Moloa Bay. After the Gilligan crew used the site, however, it went through several hands, including Club Med, and even an attempt by Disney to purchase the property, but nothing ever came of it. Today, it sits empty as a vacant lot with old foundations. S.S. Minnow they would never have gone out on that three-hour tour if it weren't for the SS Minnow. The production team used four minnow boats in total for filming. The first would be purchased from the Honolulu Harbor and would be towed to Kauai. After it arrived, the crew got to work gauging out giant holes in its hull with the help of power tools and sledgehammers. It had to look the part of a boat tossed about by the sea and wrecked on the beach. They would film the scenes where they set out from the harbor on day one of their voyage before running into trouble on a rental boat in the Honolulu Harbor. Another boat would be rented for the episode where Gilligan attempts to repair the belt with some improvised glue made of pancake syrup. Here's another spoiler alert. The plan fails miserably. Poor Gilligan, how'd you figure that would actually work? The final minnow was seen in the opening theme for the show in the second season only, and was constructed custom for CBS Studios for the purposes of the show. The next couple of seasons opening themes were shot at Marina Del Rey in LA. Soundstage. What, you thought Gilligan's Island was exclusively filmed on location or something? It shouldn't surprise anyone that a majority of Gilligan's Island was in fact filmed in a Hollywood studio. In fact, Gilligan and company spent most of their time at CBS Radford studio complex in Studio City, Los Angeles. The soundstage used for the show would eventually be reused for the Mary Tyler Moore show and Roseanne. Well, there you have it. Gilligan's real island may very well be somewhere. Question, Ginger or Marianne? Let us know in the comments who you think was the most attractive of the two. To this day, Gilligan's Island remains one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time. While many viewers have already made up their mind regarding the timeless Marianne vs. Ginger debate, we're willing to bet you don't know everything about the show and its iconic cast. To put your knowledge of this series to the test, we've compiled a list of questions that only a true castaway will know all the answers to. So, batten the hatches and get ready to set sail. Here comes the definitive Gilligan's Island quiz. Make sure you're keeping track of your correct answers. At the end of the video, we'll tell you whether you earned the title of a true fan based on how many questions you got right. Facts First presents, Can You Pass This Gilligan's Island Quiz? Anchors Away. What was the official name of the Gilligan's Island theme song? Was it A, The Tale of Gilligan and the Skipper, B, The Ballad of Gilligan's Island, or C, A Shanty of Gilligan's Island? The correct answer is B, The Ballad of Gilligan's Island. 2. 
How many castaways were there in total? A, six, B, seven, or C, eight? The correct answer is B. There were seven castaways in all. The castaways included Gilligan, the skipper, Thurston Howell III, Thurston's wife Lovey, Ginger, Marianne, and the professor. 3. Gilligan's Island creator Sherwood Schwartz also created what other iconic sitcom? A. MASH, B. The Beverly Hillbillies, or C. The Brady Bunch? The correct answer is C, The Brady Bunch. Many people attribute the success of Gilligan's Island and The Brady Bunch to Schwartz's keen eye for talent. He selected a great cast for both shows. 4. What was the skipper's nickname for Gilligan? A, Little Buddy, B, Second Matey, or C, Gilly Boy? The correct answer is A, Little Buddy. 5. What was the professor's full name? A, Randolph Hoover, B, William Jefferson, or C, Roy Hinckley? The correct answer is C, Roy Hinckley. Hopefully these first questions didn't stump you. We're about to take things up a notch. 6. Jim Backus is the actor who played Thurston Howell III. However, he was also the voice of a famous cartoon character. Who was this character? A. Elmer Fudd. B. Mr. Magoo. Or C. Fred Flintstone. The correct answer is B. Mr. Magoo. Can you hear the similarities? Good night, Waldo. I'm going to the movies. <laughs> 7. The show takes place on an island off the coast of Hawaii. But Marianne is not a Hawaii local. What is her home state? A. Iowa, B. Texas, or C. Kansas? The correct answer is C. Kansas. Fun fact Marianne was based on the character Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, who's also from Kansas. 8. Bob Denver wasn't the first actor offered the role of Gilligan. In fact, Sherwood Schwartz initially offered the role to another popular sitcom actor. Who was this actor? A. Jerry Van Dyke B. Dick Van Dyke Or C. Don Knotts The correct answer is A. Jerry Van Dyke. He actually turned down the role of Gilligan even though his agency was pressuring him to take it. Luckily, Bob Denver turned out to be the perfect fit, but Schwartz admits he was nervous about casting him at first. 9. While on the island, Marianne, Ginger, and the Professor form a musical trio. What did they call their group? A. The Ladybugs, B. The Honeybees, or C. The Butterflies? The answer is B. The Honeybees. In this episode, they had someone else sing for Marianne. Jackie DeShannon is the singer you hear in the performance. 10. Before starring as Marianne in Gilligan's Island, Dawn Wells used her stunning looks to compete in beauty pageants. Which of the following titles did she win? A. Miss Texas, B. Miss Teen California, or C. Miss Nevada? The correct answer is C. Miss Nevada. We are so lucky that Don Wells decided to lend her beauty to the role of Marianne. We're halfway done. If you're enjoying the quiz so far, click the like button so we know to make more. 11. Gilligan wears a wristwatch featuring a fictional cartoon character. What's the name of this character? A. Wally Beaver B. Sammy Squirrel or C. Manny Moose The correct answer is C. Manny Moose. In the episode, Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, Gilligan tries to leave this watch and his other jewelry to Marianne and Ginger in his will. 12. In 1987, some of the familiar faces from Gilligan's Island reunite in another sitcom. What sitcom do we see Gilligan, the skipper, Marianne, and the professor reappear in? A. Alf, B. The Golden Girls, or C. Newhart? The answer is A, ALF. 
In the episode, Alf becomes a huge fan of Gilligan's Island, so much so that he falls asleep and dreams he's stranded on their very island. 13. The pilot episode for Gilligan's Island did not feature the same actors and characters we've come to love today. For example, Marianne and Ginger were not a movie star and a farm girl. What jobs did they have instead? A. Flight attendants B. Secretaries or C. Teachers The correct answer is B. Secretaries. They also changed the theme song after the pilot episode. 14. According to the backstory, Gilligan once saved the skipper's life during WW2. How did he do this? A. Pushing the skipper away from a loose depth charge. B. Saving the skipper from choking on a piece of crab. Or C. Saving the skipper from drowning during a storm. The correct answer is A. Pushing the skipper away from a loose depth charge. Gilligan is surprisingly heroic. 15. The Gilligan's Island series was so popular that it was followed with multiple made-for-TV movies. Which of the sitcom's original actors did not appear in these movies? A. Natalie Schaefer B. Don Wells or C. Tina Louise The answer is C. Tina Louise. The actress declined the role because she felt that playing Ginger ruined her career by typecasting her. Just five questions left, last chance to prove your knowledge. 16. In the pilot episode of Gilligan's Island, the flags in the harbor are flying at half-mast. Why is this? A. In recognition of President Kennedy's assassination. B. In recognition of the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Or C. In recognition of the Bay of Pigs invasion. The correct answer is A, in recognition of President Kennedy's assassination. The cast filmed their final episode on the very same day. 17. What was the name of the mad scientist who lived in a castle on Gilligan's Island? A, Dr. Frank Enstein, B, Dr. Igor No Goodnick, or C, Dr. Boris Balinkoff? The answer is C, Dr. Boris Balinkoff. He's played by actor Vito Scotti, who's also known as the man of a thousand accents. 18. The SS Minnow has the name Minnow in honor of what real-life figure? A. Hawaiian Senator James Minnow B. FCC Chairman Newton Minnow Or C. CBS President Willard Minnow The answer is B. FCC Chairman Newton Minnow Although this wasn't really an honor. Newton 19. Years after playing the skipper on Gilligan's Island, actor Alan Hale Jr. owned a restaurant in Los Angeles. What was the name of this restaurant? A. Alan Hale's Fishnet. B. Alan Hale's Crab Bucket. Or C. Alan Hale's Lobster Barrel. The answer is C. Alan Hale's Lobster Barrel. Sadly, this restaurant closed its doors for good in 1990, the same year that Alan Hale passed away. 20. Gilligan's Island maintained consistently high ratings throughout its running, until the 1966-67 season. It dropped out of the top 30 because another show began running at the same time on a different channel. What show was this? A. The Monkees B. I Love Lucy or C. The Lawrence Welk Show The correct answer is A, The Monkees. Fun fact, Gilligan's Island, The Monkees, and Star Trek all shared a common costume. Often referred to as Trelane's jacket, this regal cloak appeared in all three seasons within weeks of each other. So, how'd you do? Count up your correct answers and we'll tell you if you earned the title of a true castaway. If you answered 16 to 20 of these questions correctly, congratulations. All your time on the island has paid off. If you answered 11 to 15 of these questions correctly, well done. You have a respectable knowledge of our lovable crew. If you answered 10 or fewer questions correctly, you may need to spend some more time stranded with Gilligan's Island. We'd like to know how you did, so leave us a comment below sharing your score. Want to prove your knowledge to others? Send this video to your friends to see if they know Gilligan's Island as well as you do. Well, there you have it. Some of our best Gilligan's Island facts and stories. Let us know below if you passed the quiz. And of course, if you loved today's video, be sure to like, 
comment, and subscribe. We'd love to know which show we should do a compilation of next.